Both these men almost died at the hands of the UVF. They later learned there would be killers were working for the security forces. I thought the police were the art of attacking, but they admitted liability. It's beyond belief. The PSNI have been fighting court orders to release information about the past. The state do not want to recognise the extent of the quagmire that existed in Northern Ireland. But judges have had enough. Tonight on Spotlight, how the courts caught the PSNI failing to release crucial evidence. I honestly think that if an English police force were repeatedly refusing to produce documents and saying we can't do it, it's too difficult, there'd be an outcry. But because it's Northern Ireland, people just seem to accept it. In Dublin, there is a man with a question few people can ever ask. Derek Byrne wants to know who put him in the morgue. Derek was pronounced dead at the age of 14 on the single worst day of the Troubles. Car bombs exploded within minutes of each other, three in Dublin and one in Monaghan Town in May 1974. 34 died, including an unborn baby. There were no warnings before the bombs went off on streets crowded because of a bus strike. Derek came close to being the 35th victim here on Parnell Street. I was facing the welcome in pub. The car that blew up was about 12, 13 feet away from me. And I heard an awful lot of screaming. I remember a, a priest giving me uh, absolution. I was put in an ambulance. Well, I was told I was pronounced dead on arrival to the hospital. I woke up in the morgue then. I remember waking up and uh, I just looked around. I screamed and the morgue attendant went out. She got doctors and nurses or porters. I was brought straight up to the theatre. And I had uh, ankle injuries, knee injuries, hip injuries, facial injuries. But he, he said the worst injury I had was the juggler vein. So shrapnel had actually ripped Severed it. And he told me I was 18 hours in theatre. And when I didn't wake up till three months after, I was in a coma for three months. 43 years later, Derek is still having shrapnel removed. His survival was miraculous. But the bombing killed a dream a dream that might have taken him away from the poverty of 1970s North Dublin. So this is, uh, you were born in one of these? Yeah, fire block. How many lived in that one? 14. Mother and father and 12 ch children. How many were to a bedroom? There was, uh, the boys slept in the sitting room and the mother and father and all the girls slept in the, the bedroom. At 14, Derek dreamed of becoming a professional footballer. But the bombing happened days before he had a trial with a major club in England. I got paid at, at, at lunchtime. And um, I got off to work by a pair of football boots. I was going for a trial that Saturday morning to England. I never got the way of the football boots. Do you ever think what would have happened if you'd gone for your football trial in England that day? Well, I was told I would have made it. So, I might have asked someone else's game. Derek never played football again. For decades, he has tried to find out who carried out the attacks and why. But each time he's come close to answers, another hurdle has been thrown up in his path. Like many of the Dublin Monaghan victims, he thinks that's because the bombers turned out to be closely connected to the security forces in Northern Ireland. Okay. 
Almost 20 years passed before the bombings were claimed by the UVF. Soon after, a commission of inquiry in Dublin revealed that this farm near Glenan in County Armagh was where the Dublin bombs were suspected of being made. And this was the man accused of making them. Spotlight confronted James Mitchell about the allegations in 2004. Were the bombs made here? You know nothing about the Dublin bomb. I didn't know they had anything. It's not true. Mitchell died in 2008, but in the 1970s he was at the heart of a UVF group that has become known as the Glenan Gang. A gang that included serving police officers, soldiers and security force informers. The group is believed to have carried out more than 100 murders, including the Dublin Monaghan bombings. I could have lived with it. Just saying terrorists, if terrorists were involved in it. But then, when you know members of these organisations were also members of the British establishment forces, army personnel, the whole lot, and police officers, why is the sovereign state allowing members of the armed forces to collude with known terrorists? and kill innocent men, women and children. You all should have a copy of the report now. The Commission of Inquiry in Dublin tried to find out more about the security force links to the group, but said it was hampered by the British government's refusal to hand over some files. The Glenan families then pinned their hopes on the PSNI's historical inquiries team, based here near Lisburn. The HET began establishing links between scores of Glenan gang killings. Anne Cadwallader has researched and written extensively about the Glenan gang. Her work has been submitted as evidence in court. At the beginning, the HET talked about alleged collusion. Very soon after they began looking at the archives, they dropped the word alleged. And then as they went deeper into the files and read what was there, they started saying things like, this is as bad as it gets. This was a cesspool. This was senior HET investigators? Absolutely, absolutely. Very senior HET investigators. HET detectives were so convinced that there was widespread collusion that they expanded their work. They prepared an overarching report tying together the Glenan cases. But when it was 80% complete, the families were devastated to be told the report would be shelved. But the lack of warning and heavy casualties fit the grim pattern of sectarian revenge killings. Trevor Brecknell was murdered by the Glenan gang when he went out to celebrate the birth of his newborn baby daughter. Two members of the security forces were suspected of involvement in the 1975 attack. The gun used to kill Trevor Brecknell was taken from an army barracks. It was used in 10 other murders. His son, Alan, had been counting on the HET report for answers. Why do you think that report was never concluded? Part of me says and, and that, that there's information that people don't want to come into the public domain. And I think somewhere along the line, someone has said, no, we can't go there at this particular moment in time. I think there was a fear that uh, to have completed that report uh, would have left uh, that accusation of uh, systemic collusion in the mid-1970s, in the mid-Ulster area, very easily made and upheld. It was going to be acknowledged from, from within uh, an arm of the state that this is what had happened to them and had happened to their families. And I think the absence of the overarching report was devastating. Um, I can't put it any other way. It wasn't just the families that were devastated. 
The detective who was writing the Granan report was so concerned about the decision, he gave the families this affidavit. In it, he said, until the entire Glenan series was reviewed, it was impossible for an individual family to be aware to the fullest extent of the collusion in the series. He said there was no explanation for the report being shelved. The unfinished Glenan report has been gathering dust for seven years. HET were closed down in 2014 and their work was handed over to the PSNI's Legacy Investigation Branch. Relatives asked the PSNI to finish the Glenan report. They refused, saying it would drain resources from other investigations. Ironically, HET were closed down because a review found the unit had been too soft on the state. Detectives had not investigated deaths linked to British soldiers as rigorously as those attributed to paramilitaries. Now the PSNI say the HET report that was going to be deeply critical of the state is also flawed. Assistant Chief Constable Mark Hamilton is the head of the Legacy Investigations Branch, known as the LIB. Why wasn't that thematic report into the Glenan killings? Why wasn't it completed? LIB's view of the report would be a little bit different to HET's in terms of quality, and we, our view would be the whole thing would need to be done again. And on what are you basing that? Upon the professional expertise of our investigators. Hey, thank you. For the Glenan relatives and their supporters, the PSNI's position was another obstruction. We have a saying amongst ourselves that the state really has only three tactics, and they all begin with D. Deny until the evidence is so clear that you can no longer deny, then delay, which is the, I think, the stage that we're at now, which is put it off for as long as possible. And finally, death. They're hoping that all the families will one by one die off, and indeed family members are dying off. The Glenan families went to court to challenge the PSNI's refusal to revive the report. Seven weeks ago, the judge in the case, Mr Justice Tracy, said the PSNI was wrong to drop HET's overarching report. He said the HET had found direct evidence of collusion in at least three Glenan cases, credible suspicion of collusion in about 80 more, and he said that deserves further investigation. Judge Tracy repeated collusion, collusion, collusion all day. This was a war crime. You're not disputing that there is evidence of collusion in at least three cases? No, because the court has held that. I'm not disputing that at all. So, very clear here, I'm not disputing the collusion point at all, Mandy. And I don't want to give that impression. In one, I'm not disputing that at all. The PSNI acceptance of collusion might seem like a big step forward for the families, but there has been no agreement yet on how the Glenan investigation might be revived. In the court, just to get this this point clear, yeah. um, the judge said that the PS and I should agree an appropriate form of relief with yeah. the families. Um, have you engaged? That with hasn't the been done yet. No. Why not? Well, we've been waiting for the final judgment so we can take our view on the entire judgment and then decide how we proceed. How do you think relief can be provided to the families? The best mechanism for relief, for our, our view, would have is and remains a historical investigations unit that is independent of us, that would be probably the best, not just for the Glenan families, but for so many families um, um, who are still waiting for more answers. The Assistant Chief Constable's preferred option, a new body known as the Historical Investigations Unit, was agreed during talks at Stormont three years ago. The HIU is supposed to take over the bulk of legacy investigations like Glenan but it was also supposed to be up and running last October. 
we've been told it will be at least 2019 before it can actually begin to work. At this point, the absence of the HIU has joined a long list of delays that are frustrating the hundreds of families from both sides of the community still coming forward and asking questions. Whether they expect answers from the PSNI, the inquest system or the police ombudsman, those families are getting the same answer. A lack of money will delay their investigations, some of them for decades. Families are completely traumatised and frustrated about the length of time it takes to try and get something resembling truth, recovery and closure. Those institutions set up to help deliver that have been dismantled and basically destroyed. Many families believe the lack of money is a convenient excuse for not proceeding with cases that will clearly demonstrate the extent of collusion. This man says they're right. Sam Pollock spent 40 years in the criminal justice system and saw the impact of informers as both chief executive of the police ombudsman's office and the policing board. The involvement of informants in the IRA, in the UVF, uh, is, was so significant that hundreds of those uh, cases will never be resolved. And this idea that the legacy work is not progressing because of financial struggles, not doubting those issues in themselves, but that is only uh, a, a camouflage. The state just don't, does not want to recognise the extent of the quagmire that existed in Northern Ireland. Police informers tried to kill this North Belfast man twice, on one occasion leaving a bomb under his car outside his house. If it hadn't been discovered that night, my children would have been forced out of the car that morning, going to school, and would have bore the brunt of John Flynn has been told for years by police that there aren't enough resources to find key evidence in his case. But High Court judges recently demolished that argument by actually directing police to the PSNI's own files about the attacks. In 1992, the UVF lured John Flynn to White Abbey Hospital in his taxi. When a gunman stepped out of the darkness, John fought him off. We're struggling for, I don't know how many minutes it lasted. Maybe five, ten minutes. He was wearing no mask, he was wearing no gloves. He had a tattoo on his hand. He was... Put it like this, he was, I was that close to him. I could smell the alcohol off him. This photo fit was based on John's description of the attacker. RUC detectives asked for help in finding this man, but some police already knew who he was. UVF member and informer Mark Haddock. I first investigated John Flynn's case in 2006. Back then, a retired RUC detective told me Haddock had been recognised as the gunman when his description flashed up on the police system that very night. But I remember them talking about his tattoo and about uh, his details had come up in the computer for that, the mur attempted murder. But Mark Haddock was never charged with trying to kill John Flynn. He is suspected of carrying out at least 10 murders while working as an informer. John took a civil case against the police nine years ago. His claim is still going through the courts. I didn't think it would actually last this long, you know. But I'm sorry, I'm getting there, you know. Do you ever think you've given up? No, never. Never in a million years. 
Three years ago, police actually admitted legal responsibility for both attacks. When I first heard that there, uh, it was actually more devastating that I, than when I heard about Haddock working for the police when he tried to kill me. The police, I thought they were there to protect me, but they admitted liability. It's beyond belief, beyond belief. The PSNI expected that admission meant they would not have to disclose information to the court, a process known as discovery. We hadn't expected for many years, particularly where liability was accepted, to have to do the full disclosure. Baroness Nula Olone thinks that avoiding discovery may have been the intention. I think the expectation or the, the sort of strategy may have been, well, if we admit liability and we pay some damages, that'll go away and we won't have to discover all these papers. And it's quite remarkable. But the High Court said the documents still had to be produced. Then the PSNI said they couldn't find any files. There was one problem with that claim. The PSNI had already provided documents about the Flynn case to the police ombudsman for the investigation into Mark Haddock. Those documents have already been gathered. They were gathered at our request and supplied to us when I was police ombudsman. A High Court judge pointed this out over a year ago. Mr Justice Colton said he could not understand why the PSNI could not find any documents. He said, if the defendant cannot identify the documentation, then one would have thought the ombudsman could do so readily. In 2016, Mr Justice Colton said that you should ask the police ombudsman for the documents in the Flynn case. Yes. Why didn't you do that then? I'm not sure why that didn't happen at the time. That wasn't brought to me at the time. Probably should have happened. If it hadn't happened, then it should have happened. I personally can't give you the exact answer to that question right now. Almost a year went by and the PSNI had still not asked the police ombudsman for the documents. At that stage, the Court of Appeal said it was astonishing that the PSNI had not contacted the police ombudsman's office to get the papers. It was over a year before the police approached the ombudsman for those documents. That's not acceptable well, in most people's eyes. It's a failure on our behalf. And I'm, you know, I'm not trying to defend anything that should have happened, um, and that's a failure on our behalf. When the PSNI eventually went to the current ombudsman earlier this year, he had no problem handing over the documents. I can't make any comment as to why it took the police that long to, to come to the office because we had the information and we gave it to them when they asked for it. So you had the information, you had it there, you had it ordered, it was just a matter of handing it over? Yes. And if the PSNI had come to you a year previous, you would still have been in a position to hand the material over? Of course, there's no question that we would have done that. And when the police finally went to the Ombudsman, he's told us that the documents were there and that he was able to hand them over within weeks. On any level, that's unacceptable. Yes, and the courts have held that, and I'm not, I'm not disputing that, Mandy. I'm not disputing that at all. I honestly think that if an English police force were repeatedly refusing to produce documents and saying we can't do it, it's too difficult, uh, I think there'd be an outcry. But because it's Northern Ireland, people just seem to accept it. I don't think it's good enough. Another judge, Lord Justice Stevens, seems to have had enough of delays. He was highly critical of the PSNI's handling of the case. He said, there has been a failure over many years by the defendant, that's the chief constable, to comply with court orders. Do you think it's ever acceptable for a chief constable um, to ignore a court order? Do you think it's acceptable that the chief no. constable has failed to accept a series of court orders? I think the chief constable accepts his responsibility here. We have to do the disclosure, Mandy. Um, we have listened to the criticisms of the court. Um, this is not pleasant for us, but more often, but more like it's not pleasant for the families. We accept that for Mr. Flynn. Uh, um, so, you know, this is not a situation that we designed um, deliberately. Is it a good thing for placing these judgments? No. D 
does it impact upon the confidence that communities have in the new dispensation for policing? It does, because that's what people are telling us. The judge has set an October 1st deadline for the PSNI to supply a list of documents they hold, or he will decide the entire case in favour of John Flynn. The PSNI told us they have 55,000 pages to sort through. They may try to appeal the judge's deadline. Will you get discovery of those documents that you, you so want? Well, the law of the land says it should. More cases are pending. The PSNI say they are facing 63 separate legal actions, just out of the report, into Mark Haddock. Other cases are linked to the British agent in the IRA known as Steak Knife, and that is far from the end of the matter. Next month, a second informer who tried to kill John Flynn is due to be sentenced. Gary Haggerty has pleaded guilty to 200 offences, including murder and attempted murder, while working as a police agent. His revelations will add to a growing number of civil actions against the police. We're now looking at perhaps up to 500 letters of claim in the area of any legacy litigation. That's over double where we were two or three years ago. When Mr. Flynn's case is, 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 is finalised, then we'll be, on a, we'll be on other cases where there are going to be similar demands. We don't believe that our organisation is constructed or resourced for the volume of what's happening um, in the legacy space. Now, I accept for a family, that's probably, those are lame words, because for each family, this is about their case, their loss or their injury, and they want answers. And I accept that. My conviction is that the vast majority of those killings will never be uh, uh, resolved because of the involvement of uh, informers in those matters. And that is uh, an affront to good policing, to the rule of law. We have learned that the squeeze on resources recently forced the police ombudsman to tell 130 families that he cannot now investigate their legacy complaints. What time frame are you talking about? Well, we could be talking about between 12, 15, 20 years, depending on the, the nature of the complaint, the complexity of it. And certainly if the funding situation continues, that's going to put even greater strain on our ability to undertake cases of this type. Many of these family members who are asking questions are already well into their 60s, 70s. You know, if you tell them that it may be 20 years, you're really telling them that you may never get round to their case. It's not acceptable. It's not acceptable that I have to say that to families. It's hugely disappointing for me. It is a tragedy for those families that have been waiting many years for answers and I have not been able to get them. Terrorists who were informants may well have gained Former police ombudsman Nula Olone says she recognises a go-slow culture in the state's failure to pay for investigations. When I um, first started investigating the activities of Special Branch, we discovered there were documents which were marked slow waltz. And really what it meant was um, put it on the back burner, don't deal with it, don't let it go any further. And that was a thinking that permeated. And that was a very strong factor in what happened. And I think delay, it's, it goes back to the question, you know, where, where people do say, you know, if, if we wait long enough, they'll die. The survivors will die. The families will die and they'll stop asking questions. They'll just give up. Nilla alone has said that during her investigations, she came across the term slow waltz, which was marked on files um, which were being spun out, which yeah. were being delayed. Um, some of the families I've spoken to have said that they're very clear. They believe that the police are waiting for them to die. OK. What would you say to that? I recently became aware of this expression myself, well, in the last year or so, just doing this job. Um, um, my understanding of what it meant was it was written on intelligence documents to say, just slow it down, don't, don't action it just at the minute. It's not a term that I use, and certainly not a policy of slow walls 
to delay disclosure. That's, that's not the case uh, at all. In Dublin, Derek Byrne thinks the slow waltz is continuing. Well, I think the British government are hoping that we'll all die. But we all have children, we all have grandchildren. And I know my, my children and hopefully my grandson will fight on. Eleven days ago, Secretary of State James Brokenshire said that the current mechanisms for addressing the past are not working as they should. Few disagree with him. This means direct and honest dialogue. Do you think the legacy the mechanisms that we have in place now are working? Well, I think we need to stop pretending that what we have is working um, because it's a deceit and it's a deceit which I think causes difficulties for families. I think we need a proper, coherent and properly funded approach to dealing with the past uh, because in the absence of that, we're going to continue to stumble on do it, doing what we do across the criminal justice system and in some cases not doing it particularly well. The government says it will unlock money for dealing with the past, but that is largely dependent on political agreement at Stormont. The Secretary of State said he will soon begin a public consultation on the way forward, but he acknowledged that he said almost exactly the same thing one year ago.